No, hi everyone. Let's get our meeting underway. I'm Deanna Henry. I'm with the Oregon Department of Energy. I'm the agency's emergency preparedness manager. Um, welcome. We're going to talk about energy security today. And before we start, why don't we just go around the room and do some introductions? I'm going to turn it over to Katie. Yeah, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. It's exciting to have folks in real life. Um, and those of you joining us online, I'm Dr. Casey Stedman. I'm with CNA. Um, Odo has contracted us to conduct the risk assessment for this project. And uh, yeah, hand it over to yeah. Andrew. Hey, everybody. Andrew Eisworth, also with CNA. Uh, Josh Rapata, I'm the uh, security operations manager for Civicor, which uh, has been big power in the control. I'm Ashley Bolts. I am an emergency management uh, professional for the County Sheriff's Office. And I am Rochelle Griffins, also emergency service coordinator at the Shoots County Sheriff's Office. Good morning. I'm Kathy Lewis. I'm the Christmas Oregon and the Regional Development Officer for Great Good morning. Alice Weston, the Oregon Department of Energy, where I'm an member here in Central Oregon. Shelby Knight, Resilience Planner with Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council. Kevin Benson with uh, Pacific Power on the uh, asset risk team deals with um, the long-term operational environmental uh, risk modeling. Good morning, I'm Brian Cochran, uh, uh, Policy Specialist, Department of State Lands. And I'm Vernon Wolf, also the Department of State Lands in the Real Property Program event. Great, thank you. Let's go ahead and see who's online with us. Sure, I'll, I'll just get on the list. Everybody please unmute and just provide a brief introduction. Um, Ashley? Ashley, can you hear us? We'll move on. Um, uh, Gabriel? Uh, this is Gabe Forrester, uh, Manager of Environmental Compliance of Montana Dakota Utilities uh, with Cascade Natural Gas. Thank you. Jeffrey? Good morning. My name is Jeff Teal. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Northern Wasco <laughs> County People's Utility District up in the Dalles. Thanks, Jeff. Kevin? Hi, Kevin Rohde, Central Electric Co-op Operations and Engineering Manager. Great. Rhonda? Hi, I'm Rhonda Nyseth with Oregon Department of Human Services Office of Re Re Resilience and Emergency Management. And I work in Klamath Lake and Hard Hardy and Grant Counties. Thank you. And then just going back to Ashley. Ashley, do you want to unmute if you can? Okay. Well, thank you everyone. And thank you for joining us because your input is vital to our overall process. Before we get started, I just wanna make sure we're gonna be sharing a lot of information today and we're gonna be seeking your input on a lot of our mitigation strategies, understanding our threats. Um, so if you can, if you haven't already done so, can you scan the QR code or join that link? Because we're gonna use a tool called Slido to get your comments so that we can uh, get your input document and our folks here can do what they do with all the data that they collect. So um, thank you everyone. I'm going to go ahead and, oh, did you, sorry. There's three in here. Did you get that? And there are QR codes on the table as well. And those online, I think you guys got the QR code yeah. and, and the link. So we have a plethora of QR codes. So some of these are for a different plan. Um, yes, we are very um, into QR codes right now. So. <laughs> but make sure you get the right QR code. Yeah, which one's All right. And I'll also just, can I? Yes. So, so the QR code to Slido, this is the platform that we'll be using for you guys to give us feedback. I will say it's a little bit cumbersome, some of the questions on a, a smart device. So if you have a laptop, that would be preferable. We also have hard copies in the room and pens. So if you find it cumbersome on your phone, you're welcome to also do it just old school and actually write something down. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, we have a lot of uh, things to cover today. We're gonna go over uh, our project timeline with you and the structure, some of our methods. Casey will be sharing that with us. Um, and then we're gonna 
go over some preliminary results from our energy systems risk assessment, and then talk about who has been engaging us, you know, where they come from around the state, as well as talk about those risk analysis results. We've come up with a suite of preliminary mitigation strategies that we definitely want you to weigh in on. And then we'll talk about next steps and what happens after this entire roadshow that we've been going. But before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about what the Oregon Energy Department does. We do a lot of things. We have a small team of about 120. That's a small agency compared to some. But we do establish the energy goals and policies for the state. We are the central repository for all energy information, data, and analysis. We uh, provide education and outreach on energy issues. We do grant administration as well as regulate and oversee some of the siting of the energy facilities in the state. Now, our division is the Nuclear Safety and Emergency Preparedness Division. We focus on the protection of the public and environment. And some of you may know, but we do the Oregon Fuel Action Plan. We develop and maintain it. So it's our responsibility that even in a worst case disaster, we have strategies in place to ensure that we have adequate fuel supplies to support the state's response and recovery efforts. In addition to our fuel resilience work, we also maintain the statewide contingency plan for radiological emergencies at fixed facilities um, with potential impacts to the state of Oregon. And then we take the lead on ensuring that all radioactive materials that are transported on Oregon highways are done safely. So um, that's part of what we do, but we also then lead the development of the energy security plan. So what are we gonna do today? Since we kicked off our stakeholder engagement with all of you, a lot of work has been done since last fall. So we're gonna give you a project progress update. We're also going to share about the energy systems um, risk assessment that was completed and some of those results. And then again, those mitigation strategies um, that you, we wanna hear from you about what you think in this region, what makes sense in reducing risks. A little bit more about our project team. Um, CNA, you've met Casey and Andrew. They're also partnering with Haley and Aldridge to do some of the technical analysis work. They've done a lot of work in the CEI hub that you guys have all heard about. We also are working very closely with the Oregon Public Utility Commission, really leveraging their expertise and experience with the electric, electricity and natural gas sector. So they're a part of our team. And then, of course, you all, because all emergencies start at the local level, and um, you guys have unique understanding and experience with the energy and security um, in this region, and we'd really like your input um, and knowledge on what works, what you think will and won't, um, as far as reducing risks. So the energy security plan is guided by both state and federal requirements. Um, the Federal Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act, as well as Senate Bill 1567, directs that our agency develop an energy security plan that assess all threats and hazards to meet energy systems in Oregon. That's all natural disasters, as well as uh, man-made disasters like physical attacks or cybersecurity attacks on the energy systems. We're also having to provide an energy profile that describes Oregon's um, energy demands and consumption, as well as describe the electricity, natural gas and liquid fuel systems from production all the way to end use. We have to talk about our energy emergency response plans and strategies to uh, manage and address supply disruptions, as well as uh, speak on multi-state regional coordination because energy emergencies in our state can very well impact the supplies in other states. And you know, energy emergencies don't stop at the state line. So um, then Senate Bill 1567 also adds an additional fuel component that is above what the federal requirements are. And I'll talk more about Senate Bill 1567 later on in the presentation. So what is the goal of energy security? We 
align our goal with the federal goal, and that's to ensure that we have a reliable and resilient supply of energy through efforts to identify, assess, and mitigate risks to the energy system so that we're better prepared to respond and recover from supply disruptions. But Odo added four keywords at an affordable price because equity and the ability to afford energy is very important to us because if we don't have that, we're creating our own energy insecurity. So that's going to be a part of our plan as well. So what's our strategy? There are so many organizations and agencies that have done great work, studies, reports on energy issues. So our strategy is to combine all the current relevant information on energy with our new analysis that we're doing on risks and threats to the energy systems. We're combining that. So ultimately, our goal is to create a suite of mitigation strategies that we can invest in in the future to improve our overall resilience and energy security in Oregon over time. And one of those strategies comes from Senate Bill 1567. Legislators directed our agency to assess the viability of increasing fuel storage around the state so that we're less vulnerable to a Cascadia event. We all know that um, in a 9.0 Cascadia earthquake, our region's fuel infrastructure will be devastated and it will take um, weeks, if not months, to get fuel supply into Oregon to the impacted communities. But because of widespread damage to the transportation systems, it's going to be very difficult to get fuel to those Western state uh, communities in the West of the I-5 corridor. So the idea here is to increase fuel storage in strategic locations that may likely be um, survive a, a, an earthquake. You know, we're going to factor in those 31 islands that the Department of Human Services has been studying and see if we can find strategic locations just to increase a little bit of fuel so that we would have a little bit more on hand should we have this disaster. And this is just to be clear, we're not talking about replacing the CEI of fuel terminals. This is just to make communities uh, less vulnerable and less reliant on the CEI hub while we're trying to bring an outside fuel resource into the state. And we would be focusing mostly on public facilities like, uh, you know, ODOT maintenance yards, gas motor pools, public works yards, local airports, those kinds of facilities. So a lot of data has been collected. We've been doing surveys, interviews, meetings with all of you, local, state agencies, federal agencies, as well as um, environmental justice organizations and our private sector partners. So a lot of data, please you know, feel free to visit our website to track our progress, or you can scan the QR code here. Is this the same, a different QR code? <laughs> <laughs> but to track our progress and um, yeah. So right now we are, um, doing our road show. Uh, last Tuesday, we were in Tillamook, Wednesday in Portland, Thursday in Pendleton. Today, we're here in Bend. Tomorrow, we'll be in Salem. And then we wrap up our sixth region road tour in Medford on Thursday. So that's where we're at right now. We have a lot of work that we're going to be doing on uh, SB 1567. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then even though this is a living document that we don't want to sit on a shelf, we're going to be updating it annually and, and changing what we need to change, updating, tracking mitigation strategies, those kinds of things. We do have to submit a completed plan with the governor's signature and a letter that says uh, Oregon's fuel act. Um, Fuel action plan. Oregon's energy security plan meets state and federal requirements, and that we get rated on our plan by the U.S. Department of Energy. And if we don't do well, we don't receive funding. So uh, there is a good incentive there, but it's a good thing, and we want to do well on our project. That's kind of the overview right now. Are there any questions before we dive into the data? 
Um, I'm going to turn it over to Casey. Thank you. So what I'm going to start with is just giving you guys um, an overview of how we're approaching this task. So I'm going to give you the timeline and the structure of the project. And so as we do that, what I always like to go back to are the objectives. Why are we doing this work? And so as a reminder, we're working to identify, assess, and mitigate risks to energy infrastructure in order that we can plan for, respond to, and recover from an event that would disrupt our energy supply. So as we work towards these objectives, we're uh, approaching it through a series of efforts outlined in this Gantt chart. On the very top is stakeholder engagement. So we really do see this as the backbone to this project. We're aware that the ESP will not be successful if it does not reflect your priorities and how those vary region to region across the state. So our stakeholder engagement efforts last the lifetime of the project starting last fall and wrapping up this summer. We've also spent several months focused exclusively on data collection. So robust efforts here trying to get the best data possible for our analysis. And then we have the risk assessment and development of risk mitigation measures. I'll be giving you guys preliminary results on these today and importantly asking your feedback particularly on those mitigation measures, so we can understand what needs to be prioritized in your region specifically. And then, of course, as Deanna mentioned, we do have the fuel storage branch of this project as well that goes along parallel. So we're structuring it spatially based on the regions as designated by um, OEM. And so many of you in this room, it sounds like, are probably already quite familiar with the map on the left with each of these six regions color-coded. You'll be seeing them consistently today. We also are engaging directly with the tribal governments. We want their perspectives as well. So you have a snapshot on the right here of the distribution of their headquarters across the state. And then within the energy sector itself, we're looking at three subsectors. So content will be divided across the electricity, natural gas, and liquid fuel subsectors. Within stakeholder engagement, we do have a series of efforts specifically here. We started with the stakeholder kickoff last fall. And then we had two efforts that were similar, but directed at two different um, groups of stakeholders. So these yellow bars are where we made efforts to solicit data and understand threats. And we engaged directly with the private sector and the public sector for both of these efforts, um, trying to get representation across all six regions. We do have meetings for the fuel storage part of this project. And then as Deanna mentioned right now, we're in the middle of this road show where we're traveling to each of the regions in person and offering these hybrid meetings. And then of course, as we wrap things up, we'll have a project rollout. So just a snapshot, Deanna covered this, um, that this is where we stand in the series of meetings. So we're in our second week, we've got two more meetings to go after Cascades today. So how did we approach this? First, we needed to understand the infrastructure. We don't have time to get into the detail of all these maps, so I understand they're too small to see on this screen, but in your handout, you can look at them in detail. If you're online, there's a link in the chat where you can access the handout that will have some resources, um, some, uh, a subset of slides that you can look at in detail as needed. So um, for the electricity subsector, we have a series of three maps. One is, does anyone in the room need it? I can pause if you'll see that. Okay, so in the electricity subsector, the first map is focused on sourcing. So this is looking at the different power plants and the sources of those power plants and the capacities and so on. We also have one focused on transmission. So these are the primary transmission lines throughout the state. And then there's a third map focused on customers. I will actually give a little bit of detail on that map on the next slide. For natural gas, we have a single map. These are your major pipelines and your service providers. And then in liquid fuels, we have quite a collection of maps that we've created because there are so many commodities that fall under this category. I've given you an example in your handout focused on diesel because this starts to highlight some of these primary flows that we see for liquid fuels in the state. So you have one focused on sourcing. So you'll see, for example, the pipeline coming down from the north, maritime imports. We also have truck and rail represented there. And then you have distribution. Your distribution map is the result of a routing analysis we did in GIS that helps us to understand some of these primary roadways that are used in distributing these commodities. So I said I would come back to this customer's map for the electricity subsector. What I want to highlight here is that we do have 41 utilities in the state, and three of those are investor-owned utilities. These are those larger utilities, and they're represented in the pie charts here by the color red. 
And so for each county, we have a pie chart sized by the number of customers served, and each slice of that pie represents the type of utility serving those customers. And you can see that the red color is a pretty dominant color throughout most of the counties, so those play a, a pretty large role. The eastern region has a lot of cooperative-owned utilities, which are in blue, and then you have the municipal utilities in yellow and people's in orange. So we took all of this preliminary data, um, you know, the data that we've solicited, feedback from stakeholders, um, our literature review, we were able to narrow down the types of threats that we would include in our analysis, and they're summarized in this slide here. So for natural hazards, we do have the Cascadia subduction zone, earthquake, and tsunami. This is the big one, the 9.0. We also have drought, flood, lightning, wildfire, windstorm, and winter storm. And then for human cause threats, we're focusing on cyber attack and physical attack. Something important here to note is that these are defined as intentional attacks on the energy system. So this would not include something like a car accident that damages infrastructure. It has to be an intentional attack. And so again, don't have detail of time to go into great detail with these maps, but I did want you to have a snapshot of hazard zones. And so this is in your handout if you want to take a peek at it. Um, your big takeaway here is just that there is a lot of variability in both the distribution and the extent of the different hazards. So in the top um, right, for example, you have a flood hazard. The distribution, it's present in all six regions. The extent, somewhat limited relative to some of the other hazards. For example, annualized drought right next to it. Distribution, it's not a, a dominant threat in all six of the regions, but where it is present, the extent is quite great. It extends throughout most of that region. And so you can take a look at some of these different um, natural hazard zones in your handout. So going back to these types of hazards and how we're approaching the analysis. For the natural hazards, as I just showed you, we're able to create these hazard zones. And what we do in a technical analysis is we look at how those hazard zones relate to infrastructure, different types of infrastructure, how that energy flows through the energy system, and we're able to analyze the risk as it relates to distinct threats. This is a very data intense process. And for the liquid fuel subsector, we were able to secure sufficient data to conduct this technical analysis. However, given the time constraints of this project for the electricity and natural gas subsectors, we were not comfortable with the data that we were able to secure that we could conduct a robust analysis. So what we decided to do was pivot and we created what we're calling a hybrid survey. And what this does is it gives the utilities, the service providers, an opportunity to conduct a self-assessment that gives us the data points we need to come up with our vulnerability rankings. And I'll walk through how we're approaching that. So for liquid fuels, we did do our technical analysis for all of the natural hazards, but for natural gas and electricity, we used the hybrid survey. For um, human cost threats, because of the nature of these threats, we can't create a hazard zone. And so for consistency, we use that same hybrid survey approach for the natural hazard, for the human cost threats across all three of the subsectors. And so this is how we approach the analysis, whether it was through the technical analysis or the hybrid survey. We divided our types of information into four categories. We start with exposure. So this is looking at historical events, future projections, simulations, a combination of those depends on the threat and what type of data is available. And through that, we're considering the assets that are exposed and how frequently they're exposed to that threat. For sensitivity, we're looking at the inherent qualities of the assets that would inform us as to how they would be affected by different threats. And we're just looking at how many of these system elements are sensitive to a given threat. Then for potential impact, we want to understand the customers impacted and the time it takes to restore service. And for adaptive capacity, we're looking at a collection of different measures, whether they be physical or operational. We are using operational in a very broad sense here. And then we also considered the maturity of the implementation of those measures. And so we can simplify these categories down into a rating system where each category gets its own score falling somewhere between zero and three. We simply add those values up and that gives us our overall vulnerability ranking. So in a scenario such as this one, we have high exposure, so we have a score of three, high sensitivity, which gives us a score of one, high potential impact, a score of three, 
and then very high adaptive capacity, and here the scoring is inverse, so we get a score of zero. So this means in this case, um, for this region of great measures, they've gone to great measures to adapt to a given threat. So we simply add these together and it gives us a total of seven, which would fall into the moderate level of vulnerability. So with that, you guys have an overview of what's going on, how we're approaching it and the different um, approaches we're taking for the actual risk assessment. The next half of our time together is going to be spent with you guys really giving us a lot of feedback. And so again, if you haven't connected to Slido, please do so. Um, if you need a hard copy in the room, uh, you can take a moment to do that. We're gonna take about five minutes for everybody to do whatever they need to do or connect to Slido. And then whenever we come back, we're gonna start uh, participating in the engagement through the Slido platform.
Hey, can you guys? Hey, can you guys... <laughs> yes, but now it's a bad echo. Technical difficulties, everyone. We'll get figured out. Okay, can you hear us online? Rhonda said they can hear us. We're just. Okay. Yeah, just leave them. Yeah. By region. I'll just keep talking. So it's not no surprise to us that it's it's new. Just leave the page. Okay. There we go. So it's no surprise to us that there's more fuel storage near population centers. And that's what I just wanted to um, note on, on this slide. But SP, SB 1567 does ask us to look specifically at publicly owned um, facilities. So we're talking about ODOT, um, local airports, um, DAS motor pools, and those kinds of locations. And so when we're only looking at public facilities, then the storage capacity, of course, gets reduced significantly. And um, we're talking about now less than um, 1.3 million gallons of storage capacity. And it's no surprise to us that the private sector owns most of the storage. So um, and we only have like 222 tanks when we're looking at public utilities. But earlier this month, we met with ODOT, Department of Administrative Services, Parks and Rec, Corrections, Aviation, all those folks that own and operate their own fuel sites. And right now they are assessing their sites and looking to see if there's a strategic location where they could actually increase fuel storage, again, not to replace the fuel hub. These are small amounts of fuel so that we would have extra on hand for emergency response um, purposes. And at this point, you know, we do want to come up with a short list for legislators to consider. And there is no current plan right now for a funding source to um, for this work. But that right now our target is just to get a short list for legislators to con consider. And then I don't know if you can tell from this uh, map, but the I-5 corridor in the West, you know, we all have seen these maps before. This is the most uh, impacted area towards the coast. And so perhaps those locations might not be the best options for increasing fuel storage, but we're looking at the Cascades um, region here. And so uh, looking pretty good for possibility to increase fuel storage, but even though studies have shown that the Cascades region will be uh, impacted directly, you're going to get extended power outages and you're going to experience fuel shortages. So, you know, we're looking at locations that have adequate backup power or ability to put in backup power. So 
here are your locations. And I think our question to you all in the region is, do you have locations that have adequate backup power um, that you might want to consider increasing fuel storage? And if you do, you're going to get an opportunity here in a short while to say, yes, I do. And then our agency will reach back out to you and begin those talks. And just want everybody here to understand that whatever locations are being considered will be evaluated against our risk analysis results, against Dogami um, seismic uh, criteria with the islanding that we're talking about what the state will look like after a Cascadia event. Um, and then I do want to also say that don't we're not ruling out any location because while we're planning for the worst case, Oregon experiences winter storms. Often Southern Oregon is cut off from the supply chain for a little while. So, you know, whatever makes sense, um, whatever you think is a good site, just let us know. We can just vet it and and put it through the criteria. We have established criteria for fuel points of distribution for a Cascadia event that FEMA helped us put together. And that's, you know, so we have that list of criteria as well. So again, we're going to evaluate each location. And when we get to that short list, we're going to be meeting with communities as well, because um, there might be an added health or environmental risk. And we want to make sure that they get to voice their concerns if we're asking them to bear this additional risk on behalf of preparedness and disaster resilience. So um, that's where we're at right now. Are there any questions about 1567? All right, then I'm going to turn it over to Casey. Yeah, so this is your first chance to communicate with us via Slido. So uh, we're just wanting to know if you're interested in engaging with Odo to work on efforts to increase fuel storage capacity, please tell us yes or no. If you are filling it out in the room, um, handwritten, please make sure that your contact information is on there so that if you do want Odo to follow up with you, they have a way to do so. So what we're going to do now is move in to preliminary feedback or preliminary results. And we're going to have a rhythm to our correspondence now. So we're going to start with stakeholder engagement feedback. And I will let you guys know who has been giving us this information, what they've been telling us, what their feedback is. And then we'll do a quick check-in. From there, we're going to move on to our preliminary results for the actual risk assessment. And this will be divided across the three subsectors, so electricity, natural gas, and liquid fuels. And we'll follow the same series of content. So we'll start with who's engaging with us, um, give you that those overall vulnerability rankings in the form of a matrix. I'll dig into adaptive capacity a little bit to highlight some of the nuances in the data, and then we'll do a quick check-in. And then finally, we'll get into the risk mitigation measures. Here we've divided it across four categories. One is all systems, so very high-level approach that could apply to any subsector. And then we'll go through each of the subsectors, electricity, natural gas, and liquid fuels. And here, we'll probably spend more time with you guys giving us feedback than me speaking to you. And so I'll tee up the risk mitigation measures, and then our efforts are really focused on you guys telling us how you want them prioritized. And so this is the stage that people have found a bit cumbersome on their devices. Prioritizing them, you're dragging and dropping. So you're welcome to use the hard copies in the room if you don't have a laptop. So. Let's dive right in to stakeholder engagement. First, who has been giving us information? We have 144 folks um, total that have been participating thus far. Their distribution across the state is summarized in the map on the left. So each of these circles are sized by the number of respondents. They're color-coded by the region that they're located in. You can see that Portland Metro and Willamette Valley tend to have the highest representation, but we have had responses from across um, all six of the regions. In the top right, you can see that the majority of folks are from the government, that's the big yellow box. And then we also have a good number from private sector and consumer owned utilities, those are the blue boxes in the middle, and then a number of nonprofits and, and some other categories as well. And to our knowledge, 15% of the folks who have engaged with us thus far do have some association with environmental justice issues. So what have we been asking folks? Well, as I mentioned before, one of our primary um, pieces of information that we're trying to understand is threats. 
And so this map summarizes the types of threats and the number of citations each time they cited a threat um, across the state. And so we have a pie chart for each of the six regions. They're sized by the number of threats that have been cited for that region. The slices of the pie represent a different threat that was cited. And this is where we start to see a pattern emerge. So you might notice that the pink, red, and purple slices of the pie tend to be largest across all six regions. So what that is telling us is that wildfire in red, wind storm in purple, and winter storm in, in pink to tend to be the most commonly cited threats that are impacting the energy systems. We also ask which of the energy subsystems or subsectors are most impacted, or most often experience the type of disruption. And the bar chart on the left summarizes this for us. Electricity was most commonly cited, followed by liquid fuels, in this case specifically petroleum, and then natural gas. Something important to note about this bar chart is that we did have more engagement from the liquid fuels subsector than we did relative to electricity and natural gas. So that means we could have a disproportionately large number of sightings related to liquid fuels. The bar chart on the right is helping us understand how long these disruptions last. So how long does it take to restore that service? The most common response is that it's really a matter of days. We're looking at less than a week's time for service to be restored. We asked a number of questions related to preparedness. What I'm showing you here is simply whether backup generators are present. It's roughly divided into thirds. So the blue slice of the pie, the pie are the folks that do have a generator available. Yellow do not, and gray it is unknown. Something important to note about those that do have a generator is that the operational capacity of that generator varies quite a bit. So some do have generators that can provide full operating capacity, but it can be as simple as just providing a safe shutdown. And then our last content for stakeholder um, engagement responses is related to environmental justice issues. The pie chart on the left is helping us understand which communities are of highest concern. The big blue slice of the pie, the pie is for low-income communities, and the big yellow slice is rural communities, and that's followed by tribal communities. The, the bar chart on the right is helping us understand what the impact is. And the most common impact to EJ communities that was cited is power supply disruptions. This aligns with what they're telling us earlier, where the most common subsector impacted is the electricity subsector. And then that is followed by toxic fume exposure. So we're going to head back over to Slido. The top two questions are these general questions. Number two is simply asking what from what you're hearing, from what the other stakeholders are telling us, what resonates with you? So is there something you agree with? You're saying, yes, you're on the right track. People are telling you the right thing. You wanna affirm that for us. Question three, what do you disagree with? People are telling you something that doesn't align with your experiences or something is missing altogether that you think should be on our radar. Questions four through eight are all related to environmental justice. So any input you wanna to provide to us uh, we've got a series of questions here for you to give us those insights as well. So we'll give you a couple of minutes to work through these questions before we move on to the risk assessment results.
move on to the next section. Um, the slide will be open beyond this meeting. And so we will, if we need to abbreviate the time and you still want to provide more information, you can always come back and give us information even after the meeting is ended. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the electricity subsector. These are the preliminary results for the risk assessment. And as a reminder, we have 41 utilities that serve this state. Many of them serve multiple regions. And so whenever we add up the regions that each utility represents, we can um, calculate our sample size or the number of utilities that would be able to speak to that region and fill out that hybrid survey. And so this map summarizes N, our sample size across the different regions. You can see it ranges from seven to 11. And in the Cascades region, it is 11 on the high end. And we got about a 50% response rate from the utilities. So 20 of the 41 did respond to the survey. Importantly, the three IOUs did participate in the survey, so we got their feedback. And here you can see the actual sample sizes ranging between four and nine. In the Cascades region, you guys had seven. And here we have our vulnerability rankings. And I'm wondering if it would be helpful to turn off this slide. <laughs> Is it hard for you guys to see yeah, in the room? Yeah, the color difference will How's that? Okay, this of course is in your handout. So if that's even clearer than, than on the screen or on your screen online, of course you can reference the handout. Um, so here in these major C's, we will have the regions across the top and we'll have the threats along the side. And I'm just gonna highlight a few key findings from these different um, final vulnerability rankings. So the first thing to point out is that for the electricity subsector, they most often prioritize three, three threats. One was cyber attack, and then the other three were those that we highlighted earlier as this trend that we're seeing. So wildfire, wind storm, and winter storm. Here we put certain cells in boxes. This is where higher rankings across the regions were largely driven by exposure and impact. So for the Cascades region, you can see that relative to other regions, um, your ratings for exposure and impact were higher for lightning, wildfire, and wind storm. And then here, this Portland metro area for drought, there's was, this higher score was largely driven by adaptive capacity. So from that, you can deduce that your adaptive capacity rating was a little bit stronger relative to the Portland metro area for drought. For human cost threats, there are a few things that I want to point out to you guys. First of all, is that this feedback is largely driven by the smaller utilities. So while the IOUs did complete the survey, they give us very little feedback as it relates to cyber attacks or physical attacks. So this is really representing what the smaller utilities are experiencing. In these two categories, or for these two threats, the higher rankings are largely driven by exposure and impact. And a couple of these scores are artificially low. So you'll notice that the scores of two for Eastern and Portland metro area, they're bolded and they're underlined. In these regions, there wasn't a single utility that gave us any information on impact for either of these threats. So had we had a score for impact, we know their total score would have been higher. So this score of two we know is artificially low. Something else you might notice in general is that there's little variability across the region for a given threat. We do have uh, more variability across the threats for a given region, but we need to understand where the variability lies across the regions for each threat. To get to that, we can dig into some of the nuances, particularly as it relates to adaptive capacity. So I'm gonna walk you through our approach there and give you some figures that can help you um, have some key takeaways from it. You do not have to read this slide in detail. So please don't feel overwhelmed by this table. You're welcome to look at it in your handout in detail if you would like. I just want to present a few concepts as we presented it to the utilities. So this table relates to cyber attacks and we have five categories of measures that can be implemented for cyber attacks. And they're in the categories of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. All the other stuff on this slide is just examples of what these measures could look like. So what we did is we gave this table to the utility companies and we asked them to tell us how mature they are with regard to implementing these measures. And so on the low end, we would have evolving. This is where they're just getting this framework in place, but it's not well integrated into their business model yet. Mid-level maturity would be embedding. 
So this is where you are integrating it into your business processes and your responses. And then optimizing is the highest level of maturity where you would be considered a leader in your field as it relates to that measure. And so we asked them for those five categories of measures, how mature is their implementation? On all of the slides relating to adaptive um, measures moving forward, we're gonna have a color scheme. Lighter shades of teal and orange represent lower level maturity. The deeper colors of teal and orange represent a higher level of maturity, that optimizing level. So what we can do is we can compile this in information into some simple figures where we can have a visual snapshot to see where those opportunities for growth lie. And so here we're looking at the responses for human cost threats. We have cyber attack on the left, physical attack on the right. So we're using teal for the human cost threats. You can see there are some darker shades, particularly for cyber attack, where we had utilities telling us we are optimized in these measures. And so what we're really looking for is we're trying to train our eyes to go to those lighter shades. And you can see that physical attack relative to cyber attack has less mature implementation. So that could suggest there's more opportunity for growth within the threat of physical attack and implementing these, these risk mitigation measures or adaptive measures. So we can do the same thing for natural hazards. So this represents winter storms in your region, and these are physical measures that are being implemented. First, we have hardened. So this could be something like fire-resistant coatings. We have redundancy, so having something like a backup generator. Remove, actually taking the infrastructure out of that hazard zone. Upgrade, maybe you have a water pump, but you're going to increase the efficiency of that pump. Weatherize, adding something like storm windows. Okay, And so here you can see your responses in your region across these five categories and opportunities for growth. You can see those lightest shades for evolving for hardening, redundancy, upgrading, and weatherize. So quite a few opportunities for maturing these measures here. Our last grouping of measures are operational measures. So here the example again is winter storm specific to your region. So we have the continuity of operations plan, you know, making sure that business continues even amidst difficult circumstances. Emergency operation plan, understanding who's going to do what. The emergency response planning, what are the steps we're going to follow whenever an emergency occurs. Integrity safety plan, this is assessing and mitigating the risks to a related to a specific threat. And then situational awareness, understanding what's going on in the moment. And so you can see we actually have quite a bit of opportunity for growth here across all five of these categories specific to winter storm. So I'm going to give you a snapshot of some other takeaways. So again, we're just looking for these areas of those lighter shades. So don't let the number of bar charts, you know, be overwhelming. Um, just a snapshot here. We have on the left hand side, we have physical measures. On the right hand side are operational. On the top left is wildfire for physical measures. And so you can see remove, for example, not a lot of folks are rating themselves as very mature in that category in particular. On the bottom for physical measures, we have windstorm. Again, quite a bit of opportunity for, for maturing here. A lot of responses for, um, that are, are just evolving for hardened redundancy, upgrade, weather eyes. Operational measures on the right, we have lightning on the top and windstorm on the bottom. Again, um, these are some of the areas where across all of these, we have a lot of opportunities for maturing um, these, in, these measures that are being implemented. So that summarizes our electricity risk assessment. And like we did for stakeholder engagement, we just wanna know what of this um, resonates with you. You think, yeah, you guys are spot on here. I agree with this, this course, this aligns with my experiences. And then question number 10, anything you disagree with, something standing out, doesn't quite fit, you want us to be aware of it.
So you're welcome to come back and give us more information as you want. Yeah. So you can spend time with the information. Yeah. And the, the talks will be posted online as well. And I believe the slide decks as well. So you, you'll have everything at your disposal. I'll give you all another minute to wrap up and then we'll move on to natural gas. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, we're going to go ahead and move on to natural gas. So following these same series of, of steps, these the same content. So who has been interacting with us? Well, we have three service providers in the state of Oregon, and all of them serve multiple regions. And we did get responses from all three. So our actual sample size matches our potential sample size. It ranges between one and three. You guys in the Cascade are served by all three of these um, natural gas service providers. And we can jump right into these vulnerability rankings. And so um, the threats that were most often prioritized by the natural gas subsector were the human cost threats, so physical and cyber attacks. And the, the cells or the, the results outlined in this slide were largely driven by higher scores for exposure. So you guys in the cascade for the threat of lightning had a relatively higher exposure rate or score relative to some of the other regions. And then this for wildfire in the Southwest, this was largely driven by impact. So you can deduce that your score was relatively lower for impact. And then for physical attack, these higher scores were largely driven by exposure and adaptive capacity. Something important to note about physical attack for the natural gas subsector is that we learned after the fact that the folks filling out the survey did include instances where, for example, if someone is digging and they hit a gas line and damage it, they included that when they considered that when answering these questions. And as we described earlier, that would not fall in the category of an intentional attack on the energy system. And so that could have influenced some of these scores. So here we have a snapshot of the maturity of the measures implemented. By and large, the responses from the natural gas subsector are that they are optimized for measures <laughs> in general, um, for has natural hazards and human caused threat. Um, as an example here, we have cyber attack. You can see it's 100% optimized across all five categories um, and across all regions. We did have some clear areas for growth for physical attack in their responses. So you can see that identify, protect, and detect, they did rate themselves as not being optimized there. So clear opportunities. For natural hazards, you can see most of this slide are dark um, orange bars. So again, most of their responses are that, that they are optimized. The left-hand side, we have physical measures. Um, what I'm wanting to highlight here is that you'll notice there's only four bars in these bar charts instead of five. And so for windstorm on the top and lightning on the bottom, we didn't get any responses at all related to remove. So it could be that they didn't know their maturity. It could be that that's not a mitigation measure that they feel is feasible, so they're not pursuing it. We don't know what the cause was, but we didn't get any information on remove. 
On the right hand side, we have operational measures. On the top is Cascadia, and on the bottom is Lightning. Something that we did notice, notice as a trend in general is that situational awareness tended to score less with a less mature rating. And so that might be an area in particular that could use um, some growth. And then you can see some other areas here, particularly for Cascadia where the score was not often placed. So a few opportunities there. So again, a quick check-in. Question 11, what resonates with you? Question 12, what do you disagree with? Any questions? I have a question. Um, like looking at the risk assessment for natural gas, and I'm not super familiar with this sector, so that's probably where this question is coming from, but why would Windstorm be ranked as one of their highest risks? Yeah, I love that you're bringing that up. So we don't know why. We have some ideas around why. Um, the most likely, based on some unofficial conversations, is that it could be the dependency on electricity. So windstorm is impacting their power supply to keep their sector running or their subsector running. Some other ideas could be just damage like in forested areas where they have infrastructure and there's a direct impact. Okay. So those are two of the more common speculative possibilities. Give you just a few more seconds, maybe 30 seconds to wrap up and we'll move on to liquid fuels. Okay, we're going to go ahead and touch on liquid fuels now. And so for this subsector, we have 13 different companies participate. Um, their sample sizes are here ranging between 7 and 12. In the Cascades region, there were nine representatives. And here we have their the final vulnerability matrix. A reminder, this was the technical analysis, so a different approach from the two previous results. Um, the threats most often prioritized by this subsector were cyber attack and winter storm. For Cascadia, you can see the regions Northwest, Portland, Southwest, Willamette Valley, these tended to score highest. This was largely driven by impacts, um, not surprising given the location of that hazard zone. And then rankings here, these are concentrated in the Eastern. These were largely driven by adaptive capacity. So relative to that region, you can deduce that your adaptive capacity scores were stronger. And then again, we have some scores that we know are artificially low. So this is for physical attack. Like we saw in the electricity subsector, we did not have any responses related to impact for um, physical attack for any region other than Portland Metro. So all of these other regions actually ended up with, with rounding. They all ended up with a score of three. We know that that score would be higher if we had any information on impact. Adaptive capacity. So here we have human caused threats, cyber attack on the left, physical attack on the right. And you might notice that these results are similar. <laughs> so we got the exact same results for your region for both of these threats. So we have the same areas um, of opportunity for growth, largely concentrated in protect, detect, and recover. We couldn't create similar figures like we've been seeing for the other subsectors for the natural hazards because the data is structured very differently in a technical analysis. So I won't be able to give you that snapshot for this, so we can actually jump right back into that Slido survey. And anything that resonates with you, question 13, anything you disagree with, question 14. Any questions or comments? Comments are welcome to. So out of your If if you exit and you need to go back in, just um, it should save your results that you've entered, but or it would be logged on our end, is my understanding. So you can skip okay. to the next question where you left off. Just 
give your contact information again so that we know who to link the responses to. We'll give you just a couple more seconds to wrap up and then we'll move on to our last <laughs> section, big section of content. Okay, folks. We're into our last section. This is the risk mitigation measures. This is where I shared it early on that you guys are really gonna be doing the heavy lifting here. Because this is what's so important for us to understand, what do you see as a priority in your region? And so what I'm gonna do is just tee up these uh, mitigation measures and then really our time will be spent giving you an opportunity to give us feedback. Before we jump into that, we just wanna remind you that there is obviously a relationship between cost and effectiveness. So in general, operational measures tend to have a lower cost associated with them, but their effectiveness is a bit lower as well. The physical measures tend to have a higher cost, but can be quite effective. So we have a number of measures that can lie along this spectrum from efficiency improvements to policy, um, policy increasing the effectiveness of it, but can have a time um, delay associated with it before it gets fully implemented, all the way up to something like undergrounding and replacing pipes, obviously very costly, but has a really high potential for um, strong impact. So just framing this relationship here for you, and I wanna go ahead and, and introduce these all systems measures. So we're gonna focus first on the physical measures. These could apply to any of the um, energy subsystems. So this is high level perspective. I'm not gonna read this all to you word for word. You, can, you guys will see them in Slido to rank them. Um, just calling out a few, we're starting with drones in the top left, You know, implementing these so that we can improve our ability to inspect what's going on, for example, in an emergency. We have several options for redundancy, so different examples there. On the um, right-hand side, we have system segmentation. So this is allowing us to more efficiently isolate an area of the system that's damaged by, by subdividing the system. And on the very bottom right, you'll notice protect. This one is specific to those human-caused threats. So remember those five categories of measures the protect category tends to have more of these physical measures associated with it. So it would be something like air gapping or restricting access to actual critical infrastructure, which would be physical measures um, that would fall under protect. So what we want you to do is tell us of this subset of measures, which one ranks first for you? What's the most important? So in Slido, they're all listed. You'll just drag it up to the top, put the most important on the top and keep dragging them until you don't have any left. Most, impart, most important first, least important last. So that'll be question 15 is the actual ranking or the prioritization. Question 16 gives you an opportunity to suggest a mitigation measure. If there isn't one already in that list and you feel strongly we should be considering it, that's your opportunity to let us know. So please fill that in in question 16. So um, again, these feel a little cumbersome on phones for folks. If you want to even just fill this section out in paper, you're welcome to here in the room. Um, again, online, if you have any questions, please let us know or comments are welcome as well. We'll give you guys a little bit of time to complete this. Think through it. 
actually have a, a question. Uh, yeah. Generally, kind of consider drone inspections as a, an enabler or supplement of some of the other measures that were out in the kind of ranking hierarchy. Um, so I guess I'm trying to avoid like a double counting for like drone inspections, the same for the effectiveness of vegetation management, for example. So if if you would think of vegetation management, just any approach to that versus specifically using drones okay. for that. Thank you. There's a real lot in this. Folks, we'll take one more minute. For those of you who are still wrapping up, and a reminder, this will be open beyond today's meeting if you're needing more time. All right, folks, we're going to move on to our next category of measures. So we're still at this high level of perspective, the, um, the med mitigation measures that could apply across all systems, but this time we're focusing on an operational set of measures. So we're starting off on the top left with after action reviews, integrating artificial intelligence into different plans and monitoring. We have memorandums of understanding with the government, so those relationships are formalized and established. On the right hand side, we have a number of studies that we're recommending. And on the very bottom, we have maturity. Again, this one is applying to the human cost threats. So this is just looking in general across all five of those categories. Anything that would apply, um, fall under the, the category of operational, um, just improving the maturity of the implementation of those for the physical and the cyber attacks. Okay. So again, just teeing this up for you guys, but really, you guys, thank you for doing the heavy lifting. Going back to Slido. So now we're on questions 17 and 18. 17 is these all systems operational measures. 18 is anything that you want included that you don't see reflected there. Yeah. Is AI a tool or is AI a threat? 
Oh no, artificial intelligence used as a tool. <laughs> so, okay, for sure. Yes, yeah, <laughs> not as we don't want AI as a threat here. <laughs> We're gonna have AI battles, right? Ours versus theirs. yeah that's a nice thing Yes, <laughs> 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 All right, folks. So now we're going to move into each of the energy subsectors. So we're going to follow this um, this pattern three more times. Okay, so you're almost halfway done. So starting with electricity, um, we're going into a little more detail here, and we're looking at a subset of the threats. So we have the Cascadia event, human caused threats, lightning. This is specific to small providers. We found a distinction in the responses for large versus small providers. Um, wildfire, wind, and winter storm. Here we have the physical category of me measures on the top, operational on the bottom. And you will notice that some of these are in bold. These measures directly fill a gap that we were able to identify through the feedback and through the analysis. So that's the one distinction here. Um, so I can leave these up or I can come right back to it if you want it on the screen. But the questions we're focused on here are 19 through 22. So 19 and 20 are, are specific to physical measures. 19 is ranking. 20 is offering any other ones. 21 and 22 are the operational measures. So I'll leave, I can leave that table up for your reference if you want to see it. Um, and it'll take a few minutes for you guys to provide feedback here. We'll give you a little more time to kind of keep an eye on as you guys feel like you're wrapping up.
Okay, I'll go ahead and tee up the natural gas section here. So same setup as we saw before for the electricity subsector. The threats we're focusing on now, again, we have Cascadia, we have flood, human caused threats and wind storm, and then physical on the top, operational on the bottom. Again, those in bold directly fill a gap that we were able to identify thus far. And so the questions associated with this one are questions 23 through 26. 23 and 24 are the physical, 25 and 26 are operational. So I can leave it on the table here um, for your reference. Those of you in the room, are y'all still filling this out right now? Or y'all, um, you are, okay. Let me know what your needs are and we can, if you're planning on doing it later, if everyone is, we'll talk to everybody. <laughs> We can move along at a different pace. Oh, we would love that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the question, if you're online, the question was, after this meeting, could this survey, the Slido, be shared with other stakeholders? We would welcome that. Please do. And encourage them to watch um, the resources online that will be available. Within about a week's time, we should have them up. All right, we'll, we'll do about one more minute and then we'll move on to the next, the, the final ranking tag. Y'all are doing great, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. 
All right, folks, I'll go ahead and tee up okay. liquid fuels. This is our last ranking question. So same format, the, the threats we're focusing on now are human caused threats, lightning, wildfire, and winter storm, physical on the top, operation on the bottom. You guys know the drill by now. <laughs> Questions are 27 through 30. I can put that table back up for reference. <laughs>
I'll send the emails at this point, or if you're still with me, I'm saying <laughs> a little bit of oh, squeeze in an email here. <laughs> Okay, as y'all are wrapping up, I just want to thank you again for all of your responses, ranking those. I know it's a lot of information and we really, really appreciate it. Um, what we're going to be doing with all of this feedback from you guys is putting it together and informing what the priority should be for your region specifically and across each of the regions in the state so that we can see where this variability lies. Um, we'll be sharing all of this whenever we roll out the project at the end in the coming months. So that's our next meeting that's coming up. Because I know you miss Slido so much at this point, I want to give you one more opportunity to participate. This is anything specific to your region that you don't think was reflected. That's question number 31. We want to understand, is there something here that just hasn't been captured in the information that you saw today? We want that on our radar. If there's anything you're concerned about. 32 and 33, these are general open-ended questions. 32 is just any feedback or comments that you have for us. Please let us know. 33 is anything that Odo can do to better serve your needs moving forward. They want to know how they can help. So answer those at your leisure. And I'm going to pass things back over to Deanna to wrap up a few more slides. Yeah, so just in closing, I, I just want to share that the energy security plan that we're developing will directly inform a different initiative that our agency is currently working on, which is the Oregon Energy Strategy. In 2023, um, legislators through House Bill 3630 directed our agency to develop a comprehensive statewide energy strategy that will identify pathways to helping us achieve our Oregon's uh, energy policy objectives. And so that's a lot. Um, so this report is due um, to legislators and the governor in November of 2025. This project is already underway. And so on June 3rd, there's another opportunity for you to join us and we welcome your feedback. You're gonna learn a lot more about the energy strategy by uh, a t another Odo team. So there's another QR code and there's a handout here also that you could take with you or visit us on our website and you can find more information about how to engage in the energy strategy as well. So that's a lot. So thank you for helping us with the energy security plan, but yeah, we welcome your input in the energy strategy as well. Any questions? I can't hear Sam. So for all the ranking questions, you have to rank them all because they're required. Yeah. And if you haven't, then it won't let you submit. Oh, I don't think I did though. Yeah. Oh, I guess I left a couple out. Yeah. 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 Does anyone online have any questions or comments? Any last thing anyone wants to share before we officially close out the meeting? I thought it was great. Thank you for having us and for helping with that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We appreciate that. Yeah. Will the plan be shared publicly? Participated. You bet. We do have to deliver the plan officially by September 30th of this year. And so it'll be posted on our website. So yeah, just be following it. If we can turn it in earlier, we will. But that is our drop dead deadline. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I came in a little late because so I may have missed this. But in what way is this work being informed by the energy strategy work or otherwise? Is this just assuming that the current fuel mix we have today is what we're planning for in the future or looking at the horizons of like um, what might be happening with fuel mix around the state and increases in electricity use and decreases in natural gas and how does that come into the? Yes, there is a chapter in the energy security okay. plan that's going to address the changing trends and needs and, and what that does to our energy security. Awesome. Or, or just like where we make investments in the plan or? 
Okay. Yes, and there there will be a recommendation on the kind of investments that um, leadership can take. State and right. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone online for joining us. We appreciate it. And again, slide.